Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. We are Brianna and Courtney. Hello. What's up? So we have a couple announcements. Actually, I haven't even announced them to you. Oh, to okay. To be perfectly honest. So we had a little delay in our Spotify because we changed hosting sites recently. So you may have noticed that there were a couple episodes that didn't pop up right away. So that is fixed. If you do listen on Spotify, we should be good to go. The other thing is we are putting our episodes up on YouTube now. So if it's easy for you to listen over there, yeah, I've been working for like literally two or three weeks. There's so much of a back catalog, but the entire back catalog is on YouTube now. Murder Dictionary Podcast on YouTube. How exciting. Yeah, we've got videos. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're everywhere now. All over the place. (laughs) Murder Dictionary Podcast. Definitely come follow us. We've got memes, history. Yes. New episode updates. All the good stuff you need to know. Any news. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. And then the other thing is if you want to check out some bonus episodes and ad-free episodes, you can get those on patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast. So we've got some new people on our Patreon this week. And we wanted to say thank you to Shirley, Galilea, Angela, Lauren, and Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. We appreciate you. Thanks for joining on our Patreon. And again, you have access to a bunch of bonuses. We were just talking about another episode that we're going to record soon. So keep your eye out for that. I watched the Dr. Phil with Natalia, the Ukrainian dwarf episode. I have a lot to say. (laughs) There's a lot to go over. The thing is, you had a lot to say when we talked about it before, but now there's even more now that Natalia is speaking out herself. Yeah, it's her words. It was a whole hour of her talking to Dr. Phil. So it's just a re it's going to be a pretty good recap on the state of affairs. Yep. And then after that, I'm going to jump in with just a regular case like we would do as a normal episode, but we're going to do it as a bonus Patreon. So yeah, we got a couple things coming up. And yeah, keep an eye out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for that. And then in our show notes, you'll find links to all of those things along with our resources that we use to research this case. So if you want to do more reading, definitely check those out. And I think that we can just dive right in to our very last killer kid for letter K. Let's do it. Yeah. I just had to think to myself, I'm like, do we have more? No, we're moving on. Good. Because we've already got a couple episodes we're working on for the next letter. So Yes. Yeah. So our killer kid for tonight is Jamarian Lawhorn, who was born in 2002 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So this is a pretty recent case. Yeah. I was just thinking, I'm like, more another Michigan. Mm -hmm. But I know. Interesting. Yes. But again, like we talked about on the last episode, I mean, clearly there's so many things going on in Michigan. There's problems with funding for children, what's going on with the issues within the schools, what's going on within the families. There's just a lot to dive into there. We know that there's a a lot of problems locally and that the kids are suffering Yeah, because of all the issues that are happening within Michigan. So Jamarian lived with his mother and three siblings, along with her various boyfriends that she had throughout his childhood. Jamarian's mother, Anita Lawhorn, struggled with addiction to crack cocaine, and she was often unavailable to care for her children. By the time that Jamarian began junior high, Anita had a live-in boyfriend named Bernard Harold, who was also an addict. So we're talking 13, 14 years old. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Junior high age. Yeah. And yeah, of course, the two of them are addicts. So now she's got an additional adult in the house, but it's not like he's capable of really taking care of them. No. The family lived in complete squalor. They were surrounded by garbage and drug paraphernalia constantly. They kept the home in such disgusting condition 
that it was infested by bugs and rats. And again, there's children living here. Yeah, three of them. Not that it's okay that adults would be living this way, but, you know, these adults are making adult choices. The kids were just born into this. The utility bills often went unpaid, and they didn't have enough beds or blankets to keep warm at night. That's terrible. Anita often couldn't afford groceries either, so the house rarely had food in it for the kids. And the children, they ate so infrequently that they were malnourished, and as a result, Jamarian was extremely small for his age. That's wild. I mean, it was just the worst of conditions that you can possibly think of. That's that's severe. Yeah. Because he appeared so small and so much younger than his other classmates, he seemed really vulnerable and bullies targeted him. So he was just relentlessly picked on. He was also really shy, but he was really well behaved, too, because he wanted to stay out of trouble. Yeah, it just flies below the radar. Exactly. He really yeah. wanted to just kind of not be in anyone's line of sight. Just blend into the wallpaper. Exactly. Yeah. If I'm really shy, if I'm reserved, if I'm a wallflower, yeah. no one will pick on me. My parents will leave me alone. He was trying. It was just a tactic to stay safe, really. Yeah. It's self-preservation. Jamarian's mother was not only neglectful, but she also abused her children. Anita also let her various boyfriends discipline her kids as well, and she didn't intervene when her new boyfriend abused the children. That's just crazy. It makes to me. me so angry every time. Like, you know, with our stories that we go through, our cases here, we hear this. This, ha- you know, it kind of goes with some of these stories as people are just, you know, abusing these children. And it's just, I I don't get it. Like just random rotating doors of adult men that want to discipline kids, you know? Yeah. That are just like really okay with that too. And are just like, I've just got here, but sure, I'll beat your kid or put him in a room or, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm not like immediately just, you know, yeah, let me jump into that role. Absolutely. Imagine dating someone that had a child. Exactly. I'd feel uncomfortable telling them no, to be completely honest. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Yeah. I would just be like, okay, whatever. Would your dad say yes? Okay, cool. You can have it. You lie to me. Sure. You You know, you can get your way for sure. But to really think about walking into someone else's family and feeling okay to not only discipline or reprimand or just, you know, set some boundaries that are very simple, but really abuse someone else's children. It's monstrous. I mean, it's unbelievable. There's clearly some issues with priorities here. There's a lot going on on the side that they are not making clear decisions, not being very rational, and they don't really have enough of the wherewithal to care for themselves. How do you expect them to make an intelligent decision related to raising a child? Exactly. I mean, and I I get it, but it's always going to be jarring. Absolutely. It's shocking. But when I think of drug addiction, there's this huge component of just constantly being irritated with anything that's not being high, you know? Yeah. So if anything is fucking with your high, you are going to be mad. And so these children were living like that, walking on eggshells, now not only around one crack addict, but two. So, I mean, it was just a living nightmare for these three children. So because both parents were abusing them, her children often had to get medical attention because of how severe their injuries were. Her one-year-old had four broken bones within his short one year of life. I have no words. I mean, I'm saying words, but my God. It blows my mind. It makes me sick to my stomach and so angry. Oh, just keep going. I know, I know. The three-year-old had scars from cigarette burns all over his chest. That, to me, sounds like it's one person with something against whatever happened that period of time, whoever she was dating, that's the dude putting smokes out on this one kid. Do you know what I mean? 
Yeah, if it wasn't the other kids yeah. and it's this one and it's in one targeted area, yes. this speaks to just singling yeah. out this one kid. Yeah. It's so disturbing. It's unbelievable. Social services had actually received reports about how the Lawhorn kids were living. As early as 1996, there were reports to social services about Anita's drug use, about the home being unfit for children. So the authorities were aware of what was going on. And again, like we talked about in our previous episode, we know that the local authorities were probably had such a huge caseload. It's so easy for people to slip through the cracks when there's a lack of funding, when there's a lack of personnel to handle as many incidents as need to be looked at. And this is 96. They've got records. He wasn't born till 2002. Right. So it's like there's been multiple instances. And then you've got outside people saying, you know, things some of this isn't just coming from the school. Right. So it's just, it happens. And there's probably, they've gone to visit and they've done in-house visits or something or they see the kid, right? And like, you can't pinpoint evidence, that kind of thing, you know? And they let it slide because they won't be able to say for sure or jurisdiction or it just is another piece of paper on a desk that is covered in paper. It's either way you slice it, you know? It just slipped through the cracks. Yeah. They were aware of it, but there, I think, was just only so much they could do given the resources that they had. The other thing, too, is they're so, there's a lot of, you know, they want a family reunification. They really do. They want to give you the chance. So if you can live up to this bar right here, which is probably pretty low, we'll give you those kids back. Let's see how you do, because maybe you've learned and now you can, you know, very rarely does that work, but they keep trying. So, I mean, that's what it is. It's like the family reunification plan shit. It makes sense. Yeah. But unfortunately, with nobody really following up on it and back starting from 1996, I mean, yeah, it's just a long time for these kids to be suffering through and still be just a paper on the desk because we don't have enough personnel and funding and all that other shit. Her older daughters were removed from the home for a period of time. But they were returned to Anita after a very short time later. And social services did not intervene for a long time after that. So flash forward to 2013, an investigation was launched against Anita and Bernard for the allegation of abusing the kids. This is probably where all these medical records, one year old with four, this is where that comes in more than likely. 10-year-old Jamarian was named on the case as one of the victims. During the investigation, the social worker discovered that he had scars all over his body from being beat with an electrical cord. Even though it was clear that the kids were really essentially being tortured and neglected while in their mother's care, Anita and Bernard were not criminally charged. They were ordered to undergo parenting classes, but the kids still remained in Anita's custody. There's just nobody else to give them to also. And I'm sure there's not a lot of family that isn't going to be affected by the same disease. So there's a good chance if she has family, they've already got their own issues or maybe their other grandkid or somebody else's kid, you know. Yeah. It's a very improvised situation. That's like the best description. You're right. There probably weren't other options or like we've seen in the previous cases, the other option is just a direct trap house. You know, yeah, we don't know why they made that decision, but it seems really unbelievable to me that they weren't charged when there's just so much physical evidence of damage to her children with all these injuries. It doesn't make sense to me to not file criminal charges with cigarette burns, broken bones, and scars from electrical cords? I mean, are you kidding me? And he didn't do that to himself. And his brothers and sisters are, you know, like, that. no, that's not what that's from. It absolutely had to be the parents. Yeah, it's an adult. So it, it just is really, really disappointing and heartbreaking that 
they didn't move forward with pressing charges and they were allowed to keep custody because then you're leaving them in danger. And you want to hope that the parenting classes will make a difference. But in the meantime, why not keep the kids safe, you know? But there's, again, there's got to be something that probably we aren't privy to, you know, where else are they going to go? Maybe there's the foster system is just like completely filled up. Like who knows what the deal is? The waiting list for an adopt item. I don't know. I'm just speculating on that front. But it just is really sad that they stayed with her. Yeah. After all those injuries. So in 2013, Anita was facing more child abuse allegations. And at this point, Jamarian was sent to live with his biological father in New York. His dad agreed to let Jamarian come stay with him. But truthfully, he had very little interest in being a present father to his son. When his father was around, he would abuse him too. But he honestly wasn't there often. Instead, 10-year-old Jamarian was usually left in the care of his grandmother, who was an alcoholic. Reportedly, she was often not sober enough to take care of her grandson, on top of being a very angry drunk. She was an adult figure, body, human to be in the room right like that's that's what they were with jamarian it seems they're just looking for you know even the other one just an adult figure someone who's over 18 yeah it really doesn't even matter if they're inebriated doesn't matter if they're blowing smoke in kids face like it's it's cool as long as there's somebody there (laughs) Right. You know? And really, it's like with addiction and alcoholism, there's often times you're staying inside. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I know people socially drink a lot, but once you reach the point of complete alcoholism and addiction, you're just hanging out at home. So, of course, these kids have adult supervision, but every person that's charged with their care is abusing them. Every single one of them. It's crazy to me, but also it's like, well, abuse is systemic. It's a foundational issue. So often people that abuse have been abused previously. So I get it. I understand, but it's just so sad. So, you know, this grandmother who probably was also angry that, you know, she just wants to hang out and drink at home is what I'm assuming. It's a golden years. I've earned it. That's right. I'm retired. Let me just stay home get my drink on. But she now has to take care of this kid. So she took her frustrations out on Jamarian and she often beat him with her shoes. At this point, Jamarian became so hopeless that he thought about jumping off of one of the tall buildings in New York. And he talked about feeling just really suicidal. He was, he was just done being abused. Again, like I said, everywhere he turned, he just had no hope that it would get better. Around this time when he was staying with his father in New York, he was also accused of inappropriate behavior with his sister. But he insisted it wasn't true, and he seemed really deeply upset by the allegations. So There's a little bit to unpack here for me because there were never any charges pressed. We don't really know. We don't even have any witnesses coming forward saying, yes, this happened or what happened, any details. But right after that happened, he was returned home. He was sent back to Michigan. So there's a part of me that thinks, now I don't know if it's true, I can't say, but one theory would be that his dad just wanted to get rid of him. That's you know, a good theory. That he was just done taking care of his yeah. son. The grandma didn't want to do it. So let's find an excuse. He fucked up. He did something bad because by every other account, like we talked about earlier, he was shy. He was reserved. He kept to himself and never had any disciplinary issues. Didn't get in trouble in school. Like we said, he just wanted to fly under the radar. Yeah. So for something like this to happen out of the blue seems very strange to me. There's no way to definitively know. It's worth bringing up because 
someone said it because Either it was way. an allegation, <laughs> but it's just as likely that his dad wanted to get rid of him. Either way, if it's true, if it's false, he was still accused of something that he says he didn't do. So of course it's going to be deeply upsetting and he's a kid. So it's like, if it's not true, yeah, it's probably worse than if it is, you know, like for him emotionally inside. Exactly. I mean- for a kid that's like, yeah. I've tried so hard to be good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, where he's just like, I'm doing all these things to not get in trouble because you guys are constantly hurting me. Now I've done absolutely nothing. I'm just sitting here and you're going to accuse me of such a thing. I mean, that's deeply wounding yeah, on top of all to these other things going on. Yeah. So, yeah, I just don't know. It's worth bringing up because... Obviously, he's our killer kid for the night. Yes. So it's like, you know, is this an escalation where maybe it did happen and there was a warning sign and then maybe he escalated to violence? I don't know. Or is it just a symptom of, again, shitty parenthood? Bad priorities. Right. Yeah. We just don't know. But it is something that was said about him and we're unsure. So it's worth bringing up and wondering what this is about and discussing and trying to kind of figure out what the possibilities could be. Is being active a part of your day? If not, we can help. We're New Jersey Snap Ed, and we offer fun ways to help you do something active and healthy each day. For fun fitness ideas and activities, visit njsnap-ed.gov today. That's njsnap-ed.gov. Is being active a part of your day? If not, we can help. We're New Jersey Snap Ed, and we offer fun ways to help you do something active and healthy each day. For fun fitness ideas and activities, visit njsnap-ed.gov today. That's njsnap-ed.gov. So once he returned home to Michigan, things were peaceful for a few days. But pretty quickly, Anita began abusing him again. The situation was so bad for Jamarian that he would often run into the woods and hide so that he didn't have to be at home with his abusive parents. On the morning of August 4th, 2014, Jamarian was using the computer when his stepfather Bernard caught him. His stepfather was livid that he hadn't asked for permission first, and he reprimanded his 12-year-old stepson very harshly, as was the norm, of course. Yeah. Before Jamarion left the house that day, Bernard threatened that he would get a beating later on for what had happened with the computer. Man, I'm really big on like setting the tone for a day. Like, you know, like making sure that, you know, okay, it's going to be a good day. And, you know, like if you get into an argument with somebody like right before you're going to go, you're just like, oh, blah, 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 blah. for the rest of your day, you're just like, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah. Now, before this kid goes to school, he's just like, just so you know, when you get home, I'm going to fuck you up. So all day long, this kid who's already just like internally just frazzled, you know, yeah. but just remaining calm and wallpaper is just all day thinking, I'm going to get beat again, again, all the time. Like, it's probably might not even be in his brain. Might not even be effective anymore. This vacant threat. Because, yeah, I will be beat. Him, so, like, what's the point? You know? Yeah, he's probably like, tell me something I didn't know. Yeah. That okay. Was every Whatever, single day. Whatever, Greg. Like that. Sure. Yeah. But also, it's just, I feel like this feeling has got to be relatable for a lot of people. Of knowing your report card's coming that day. Checking the mail and being like, oh shit, I know that I'm going to get in trouble for this. And how, like you said, it affects your entire day. That's all you're thinking about. The moment you leave the house, that just you're in dread, right? Yeah. But now, if you think about the way that these three children were living, and every single day, they have the most severe sense of dread of coming home every day because they know what's going to happen. And on this particular day, Jamarian knew that it was going to be very bad yeah. because he'd been told already. It's not like he came home and, 
you know, stepdad got mad about something and whatever, it was random. He knew that the intention that Bernard had that day was to really, really hurt him when he came home. So, of course, I mean, he's just in terrible, terrible shape, completely terrified. Yeah. He was really desperate to avoid another beating. And for him, the best way he could think to get the abuse to stop was to do something drastic enough to get arrested. I wonder if he knew people in his neighborhood or like other kids that were in a really bad situation and got in trouble or something like that. And then, you know, they got in trouble uh, somehow with police, quote unquote, you know, like legally. And so then, oh, we sent him to a school. Like that's where his head is. Is like, oh, they'll take me. And they'll put me somewhere else because now it's legal, right? Now there's something with the police. Yeah. If, you know, we've got the authorities for child services coming in and not doing anything, maybe what he sees around in his environment with the police interventions seems like his only option to get out of the house. Like if he's arrested for something, there's got to be a factor to it where what he's seen makes sense that he could be in that position and get out of the house maybe just by being saw, put in jail or whatever. Yeah, maybe he saw like some kid, you know, go to some state school and get out of his abusive home and he's out, you know, yeah, he's in this, but he's not being physically beaten every day. So right. maybe it could work out for me like that too. Who knows? But it seems like that must have been Something. his thought process because it just seems to be what he carried with him throughout that day. His escape route was being caught up in the police basically. Before leaving that morning, he decided to take a handful of pills that he found just really lying around the house. And then he grabbed an eight-inch knife from the kitchen before leaving home. Do we ever know what kind of drugs, what these pills were? I don't. Hmm. Sorry. No, it's okay, because I never knew either. Like, I mean, but yeah. it's probably an upper if we're in a crack house, right? Yes, and also because he didn't seem to be suffering the effects of downers. Yeah, that you too. You know? Yeah, it just seems like if he had taken a handful of downers, he would right. not be able to carry out the kind of things he was intending that day, you know? Yeah, just just curious. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, totally, I always think that when I hear stuff like this. I definitely was too. And maybe the information's out there and I just couldn't find it. I don't Someone's know. Someone's going to let us know. Yeah, but it's just... It didn't say in a lot of the places that I was looking and the sources I had, they just said a handful of pills. I, I, I gotcha. Just curious. A short way away from his house, Jamarian stopped to play at a playground by Pinewood Village Mobile Home Park. He buried the knife that he'd taken from the kitchen in the sandbox, and then he just proceeded to start playing with people on the playground like any normal day. 12-year-old Jamarion met 9-year-old Connor Verkirky and his 7-year-old brother Cameron on the playground. So he asked the boys if they wanted to play. And remember, I was always thinking through reading this, he's older, right? That's not necessarily a huge deal for a lot of kids. Like if you're in a general wide age range, you can kind of play together. But some kids are kind of specific. Well, if you're 12, you're not into the stuff that I'm into at seven, right? That's babyish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's like my that's favorite. exactly I, it. Just descriptive. Exactly. It's but, babyish. <laughs> but I will remind you that like we said earlier, because he had been malnourished his entire life, he appeared much younger than he actually was. So although, you know, at home you may be thinking he's 12, why is he playing with someone half his age? A little weird. But nobody thought anything of it because all three of these kids kind of looked the similar size because he was, you know, appearing younger and malnourished and small for his age. So just to kind of have a little sidebar of that, because it is one thing that kind of stands out about these kids from a wide age range playing together. But there was definitely a reason for them to think that he was their age and it was normal. Yeah, I think you're on that. 
The Verkirky boys lived close by with their parents, Danny and Jared, as well as their younger siblings, Riley, who was five, and Morgan, who was three. Nine-year-old Connor was an active kid who loved soccer and doing activities with his Cub Scouts group. It's a pack, just so you know. Oh, I'm sorry. It's fine. (laughs) My family would be very upset if I did not correct you. (laughs) Scouts everywhere. So he loved to go camping and be outdoors. But when he was at home, he was known for entertaining his family with his singing and dancing. Connor and his brother Cameron were having fun playing with 12-year-old Jamarian on August 4th, 2014. They were really all getting along well, and they were having fun together for about 20 minutes. But suddenly, nine-year-old Connor fell off the slide. While Connor was recovering from his fall, Jamarian grabbed the knife from the sand and took off his shirt so he didn't get it dirty. Okay. You think that they scream at him all the time not to get his clothes dirty? Most likely. He needs to look the part, right? You can't get dirty. Can't all the- that is interesting to me. Very. Yes. To take the time when you know you're grabbing a weapon, there's intent there, and then all of a sudden, wait, 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 hold on, I have to take off my shirt. It speaks to something that's happened before. It's interesting to me because nobody's paying attention. Like, mom, you know, she's there um, enough, I guess. It's interesting because it implies that it's somebody who is very neat and orderly and wants to give off at least... Maybe not for real, but they want their kids to look perfect because everything else is a mess and they know it. But if the kid looks okay, nobody's going to ask questions, right? See, um, But at the same time, I'm like, well, they're they're doing crack all the time. This is not neat, tidy order. So I don't know. To me, this I'm not sure what it's triggering, affecting, hitting on me right now. But I'm just like, damn, that kid's been told a million times not to get dirty in the playground. Absolutely. You know? I don't know. I just... And some may think like there's a part of me that wants to, you know, approach it from the perspective that I would approach other cases where I'm like, well, you don't want blood on you so that it's not evidence. But given one, his age and two, the fact that, as we discussed before, his plan was to get arrested. His plan for murdering was he didn't want to go home and get another beating. That's right. So... He didn't take it off because of evidence. So we have to assume, like you said, that it's got to be something that happened at home. And maybe because of all of these allegations against Anita and Bernard, maybe there was this sense of, yes, the home is fucked up. However, we're going to keep you looking sharp, clean, so that no suspicion comes our way. Right? Yeah, it just it doesn't go with the narrative of bugs and rats and no. ha- you know what I mean? So it's just Absolutely not. And it, it just I don't know. It's weird. But it does make sense that they would want to cover up yeah, what's going that's on. That's the home only thing to me. By but... keeping them clean outside of the house. Exactly. But it is very, very strange that he would do that. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I just <laughs> you know, like maybe I'm just reaching, but no it just seems strange. Anyway. No, it all. absolutely does because can you think of one other murder case where you just stop to take a shirt off. Very few. If you any, know, yeah. like, yeah, no, for sure. It's rare. So there's definitely something going on there. There's some reasoning. And again, we know that most of his motivation comes from his situation at home. So taking off his shirt has to have something to do with that. It has to. So at this point, he's got the knife, he's got his shirt off. And it's very strange that he decided to come after this child that just fell off the slide because as everyone recalls from witnessing what happened that day, the boys had not had any disagreement. There was no altercation, but Jamarian just suddenly decided to target his new friend right after he fell off the slide. When Connor's brother Cameron saw the knife, he told Jamarian that he should give him the knife so that he could take it to an adult. It's a little grown up right there. He was like, yeah, just let me, yeah, you know, trying to talk him down uh-huh. be like, oh, you're not supposed to have that. Let's yeah. give it to someone in charge. We got to give this to somebody who's responsible. Take care of this. 
We're just kids. As Connor was trying to get his bearings back after his fall, suddenly Jamarian attacked him with the knife without any warning or any provocation. He stabbed Connor five times in the back and once in the arm with the eight-inch kitchen knife. Two of the wounds reached three inches deep in Connor's back, which punctured his right lung. One of the wounds was so forceful that it penetrated Connor's rib bone. After the stabbing, Jamarian ran off, leaving seven-year-old Cameron in shock, scrambling to figure out how to help his severely injured brother. His poor babies. I can't imagine. I, yeah, that's... Poor oh, thing. Poor little Cameron. So Cameron decided that he had to get Connor home. So he picked his big brother up and got under his arm to help him walk to their house. And he just was God. trying to think on his feet. And again, he's the one saying, let's get this knife to the adults. Like, he's just trying to get an adult's help here. He's yeah. like, I know that I'm not equipped to handle this. We need to get to the adults. The boys arrived at their house a few minutes later, and Connor collapsed on the porch as Cameron ran inside to get help. They called 911 and tried to stop the bleeding while they were waiting for the ambulance. And Connor was just quickly losing his fight for his life. So his parents were just above him trying to reassure him and telling him things were going to be okay. Connor responded by telling them that he loved them dearly before he just lost consciousness. He barely made it to the hospital, but they couldn't save him, and he was pronounced dead soon after arriving. After the attack, Jamarian ran directly to a neighbor's house, knocked on the door, and when the homeowner answered, he calmly asked them to call 911. The neighbors gave Jamarian the phone, and Jamarian frantically admitted that he just stabbed a boy on the playground. He told the 911 dispatcher that the police needed to hurry up and come get him before his stepfather Bernard arrived home. That's nuts. Poor Again, guy. Again, it all comes back to all he was trying to achieve yeah. was to get out of his house. The neighbors who owned the home and let him use the phone recall that Jamarian said he'd taken a bunch of pills before attacking Connor. He also told them that nobody loved him. And then he elaborated to say, quote, I want to die. I don't want to be on this earth anymore. Just desperate. He was for a so way out. hopeless. Yeah. All he wanted was to not be in an abusive home anymore. And it's so sad that there were reports coming in about the abuse that the, you know, proper channels and authorities knew this was happening but weren't able to really help out these kids. It's so sad. Jamarian believed that since he'd killed someone, when the police showed up, they would just kill him in return. So it's really his assumption was that he was committing suicide by cop when yeah. he did this. He seemed actually relieved that the police would kill him or that he would at least get the death penalty. His expectation was that he wasn't going to live. And he doesn't have any, uh, it's like, he, he's a kid and so he's very short-sighted and probably isn't receiving a lot of, when you grow up, you can be a doctor. You can go to college. You can go to school. Like, you can be something bigger and, you know, maybe better than where you come from, right? Nobody believes him. He's not him. getting any of that. So to him, it's this abuse or I'll just die. And it's just this very, you know, um, like it's it's one or the other. Yeah. It's he like, saw no way out. I live in this insanity situation that I'm just stuck in and it's a revolving door and I will become part of this system. Or I can go to prison or get killed. 
and then just it's over. It's and so it's just sad. such like tiny thoughts, like you know, short sighted kid thinking. We're not thinking clearly long term. He can't see the forest through the trees because he doesn't even know the forest, right? Like he's just been in it all along. Absolutely. And I think it is, of course, like you said, because of his age that it's short sighted and also just desperation. I think that even an adult in an abusive situation would get to this point. If you've got all these scars and breaks and injuries and all this horrific stuff, just anything is better than this, no matter what your age. And so, of course, because he's so young, it's even more short-sighted. Like, I want to do something to go to jail or die today. Yeah. That was all he could think of. You know, that was his only solution. It's so, so tragic and speaks volumes about the horrific things he'd endured. Yeah. So the police arrived and they arrested Jamarian. He told the offers that he was, quote, fed up with life because of his abusive parents and he wanted to be put in jail or sentenced to death. He was actually, I mean, pleading with them for this. When detectives asked why he did it, Jamarian said, quote, I'm bad. I'm always lying, just stupid things. I'm in trouble a lot. And again, like, is this what was actually happening or is this just what his parents are telling him? Because by external accounts from teachers and from everybody else that knew him, he tried to stay out of trouble. He was quiet. He was shy. He tried to be invisible almost. To me, this speaks of either he's trying to convince the police that he's bad because he's thinking, well, this will ensure that I'll be put in jail or death, right? Like, if you think I'm bad, you're going to punish me. Or he's just echoing what his parents have told him. Whether it's true or not, he may not be getting in trouble for actually doing anything bad, but his parents may constantly be telling him, you're bad, you're a liar, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that's a lot of that is this is what he's hearing. And like, yeah, he's probably had instances where he lied, had what you would classify as bad behavior, but not, I mean, come on. Yeah, it's just typical kids testing boundaries and that's it. He's telling the police like what he's been told he is that is a problem so that they will take him, they will believe him. And give him the death penalty. Exactly. I think that both are at play here. It's yeah. just repeating what his parents said and thinking that's going to get him in extreme trouble with the law so that he won't have to go home. That's it. Even though Jamarian was only 12 years old, the state charged him as an adult. I don't think that's right. So I'm just, this is my opinion. I know. With the history of abuse exactly alone no and just no sorry i was like and maybe no Mm -mm. (laughs) yeah there were no signs that he would be a danger to society because of previous behavior i mean i can understand if there's psychiatrists coming in and saying you know he has psychopathic traits or he's whatever it is whatever the diagnosis is but this is really a direct result of abuse And so when you take that into account, he wasn't behaving as an adult. There's no possible way. He was behaving as a severely injured and brutalized child. Yeah, the only record he has is being the victim in child abuse cases. Right. That's it. And that's not to minimize what he did. It's horrific that he took the life of another child and that this Verkirky family is just got to be suffering the most horrific pain. But, you know, he just wasn't acting as an adult. Yeah. So it's just sad when you see that happen for a child that has already went through so much. The weird thing is, although he was tried as an adult, the case was heard in juvenile court, which I don't understand. But that's what happened. And he was facing, because of the adult status, a life sentence if he was found guilty. Before the trial, they brought in psychiatrists to determine Jamarian's mental state. 
a doctor from the Michigan Center for Forensic Psychiatry named Susan Tremonti met with the boy three times, and she determined that he was competent to stand trial. Dr. Tremonti submitted a 33-page report to the judge explaining that Jamarian understands the charges against him and, therefore, he can be held criminally responsible. At the pretrial hearings, Dr. Susan Tremonti described Jamarian as, quote, alert, oriented, and in emotional control. And you hear this repeatedly through everyone, even when he was making the 911 calls, like, there's very few points where he gets frantic. He's very calm. He's in control. It's just a constant thing that you hear about him. Dr. Tremonti testified that there was, quote, no indication even when he was with me, that he was experiencing substantial deficits in his intellectual functioning. He was able to express his thoughts and his feelings. He was also able to express memories. I did not meet the statutory criteria for criminal insanity. I mean, yeah, no, he understands what you're telling him. Like, he gets it. But... It seems like his defense would have to at least try to say, like, well, he was abused and he snapped. But by all accounts, I mean, it seems like that just wasn't the case. He was very calm, cool, collected, but he had reached his breaking point. Yeah. And he just took drastic measures. She also said a key indication of his mental state was his ability to think ahead and prioritize what he envisions for the future. Jamarian told Dr. Tremani that he wanted to own his own business one day, and he said that he was interested in auto mechanics. She said to the court, quote, it speaks to his ability to think towards the future. There's a sense he can express or prioritize what he would like to see happen. That makes me feel good that he wanted to be a mechanic. Yeah. But still, I'm not buying that he has some, like, far out plan you know like he can plan like yes okay he quote unquote premeditated but like this was not planned in that sense right it's coming from a hey everything's not working at my house i've got to fix the toaster myself maybe i could do that for a living that's what i that's what it sounds like to me is just oh well i guess this is a thing i can do i like building stuff i like putting things together taking them apart and putting them back together maybe i can do that okay cool exactly like But, you know, what she's saying is basically like even the fact that he has that and he's calm, he's oriented, like all these things say he didn't suffer a mental break. He wasn't insane. Yeah. And he's competent to stand trial. The defense team was hoping, of course, to use the insanity defense. So his attorney, Charles Bokilu, requested a second independent evaluation. The defense's doctor returned with the conclusion that Jamarian was unable to assist in his own defense. After reviewing the information from both doctors, Judge Paul Denenfield decided that Jamarian was indeed competent to stand trial. Clinical psychologist Dr. Priya K. Rao interviewed Jamarian and testified for the defense, explaining that he had originally intended to use the knife on himself. Dr. Rao says, quote, he wanted to die. He wanted to end it all. He said he thought that he would hurt himself, but that would hurt too much, so maybe he could just poke another kid. That sounds in line to me. Yeah. Definitely. If we know he has a history of, you know, suicidality and wanting to end his life, it makes sense that maybe he stole the knife and was like, I'm going to leave and not come back ever again, you know, and then changed his mind. It does make sense. 
Old Navy's kicking off the holidays in style with 40% off everything. That's right. Everything on your list is on sale now. Get 40% off every pair of jeans, 40% off all sweatshirts and all hoodies, even 40% off all outerwear. Get 40% off all the holiday gifts they want at a price you want. 40% off everything at Old Navy and OldNavy.com now. Hurry in or miss out. Valid 1114 to 1119 excludes gift cards, today only and two-day only deals, gift of the week, clearance, register lane items, zip zap stuff, and jewelry. Old Navy's kicking off the holidays in style with 40% off everything. That's right, everything on your list is on sale now. Get 40% off every pair of jeans, 40% off all sweatshirts and all hoodies, even 40% off all outerwear. Get 40% off all the holiday gifts they want at a price you want. 40% off everything at Old Navy and OldNavy.com now. Hurry in or miss out. Valid 1114 to 1119 excludes gift cards, today only and two-day only deals, gift of the week, clearance, register lane items, zip zap stuff, and jewelry. The prosecution and defense both focused on whether Jamarian was capable of understanding the consequences of his actions. Prosecutor Kevin Bramble argued that Jamarian was completely aware of the wrongfulness of what he was doing, and therefore he should be held responsible. He also asserted that the 12-year-old had been planning on killing someone for over a year prior to attacking Connor. Jamarian's defense attempted to get his confession thrown out because of his age and the history of abuse, but they were actually unable to keep the jury from hearing it. I think it's weird that they think that he was going to kill someone for like up to a year. Yeah. That he's been like planning this and like, I just don't see that in this no it doesn't seem Mm -hmm. like there was anything to back that up no so the jury heard both a 911 call where jamarian coldly admitted to stabbing a stranger and the police interrogation where he recounted his actions that day after less than five hours of deliberation the jury found jamarian lawhorn guilty of first degree murder Yeah, I'm sure they, I mean, they had to. He he killed the kid. Just there was so much evidence. You can't really get past the fact that there's a confession. Yeah, no, it's it's a conviction for sure. There's no way around it. No matter how much compassion you have for the severity of the awful things that he endured, he still took someone's life and he has to be accountable for that. In September of 2015, he received a blended sentence. So this means that he would be remanded to the custody of a juvenile facility. And then at 21, his sentence would be reevaluated. That is reasonable to me. Especially considering they tried him as an adult, you know, this I whole thing. I expected it to be life, throw the key away. Exactly. For real. I did not think... Especially just the way things work. I did not expect this. So I am, I'm kind of like, nobody cares, but I'm kind of okay with this. You know what I mean? I think that's fine. It makes a lot of sense just because of his background. And, you know, it is, like you said, it's a little surprising because I feel like we just want to hold people accountable and throw the book at him. They right? immediately were like, we're trying this kid as an adult because he's motherfucking guilty. Like, oh yeah, they're they're killing. They're putting him away for sure. Right. They had three different panels of psychologists determine that he was capable, like all of this. They want him, put him away. And, of and he's course, just another statistic in Michigan. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a whole thing. I did not expect blended sentence like that. Yeah, I agree. And of course, I'm always thinking about this aspect of Anytime there's a black kid in front of a jury, it you just expect something severe to happen, you know? And it makes me so depressed that this is what he was facing and what so many kids face, yep. right? But the fact that they had at least enough compassion to say, yes, we're going to look at this at when you're 21. Let's see what your progress is, you know, and talk about it again once some time has passed because 21 isn't two years away 21 is nine years away yeah you know there's some time there for him to kind of get some stability and make some changes and i think that that's 
incredible and really impressive that they did that when we know that there's so many cases where it's like, well, there's this black kid found guilty and then the book does get thrown yep. at him. And so I'm I'm grateful that they had at least a little bit of compassion for him. Yeah, I agree. And then judging how he does, we'll know. And his state of mind at the time was also just so he had no structure. There's no routine. None of that could be one of these people that just thrives in prison. And like, yes, you murdered someone. You have got to pay for this, right? Different circumstances than, you know. Yeah, we also this see is... like when young kids are sent to an adult prison, yes. what kind of impact that has. At least, again, they give him the opportunity to be in a juvenile facility. His mental state is not that he he should, what I'm trying to say is he is definitely affected by the abuse he has suffered. He can't really necessarily be in a situation outside with normal kids. We can't have that right now. We need him to be somewhere where he can be watched, observed, you know, like get some school, get some treatment, get some people that say, hey, did you do your homework? You know what I mean? Like this kind of thing. You wake up at this time, see how he does. And then, yeah, if at 21, he's just like getting shanks and, you know, fighting people and whatever the fuck. And then, yeah, like maybe we need to reassess this. You clearly haven't learned Absolutely. shit, right? But it's an opportunity for to yeah. him to show that this isn't part of his character it's a huge, tragic mistake that he made out of desperation. You know, it's an opportunity for him to prove that that was the case instead of being a pattern, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I definitely am grateful that he received this kind of sentence. So at the point that he turns 21, his good behavior could either earn him release or a bad disciplinary record in the juvenile facility could result in a life sentence. We just don't know. And he knows that. So. Right. That's hanging over his mm -hmm. head the whole time. That's going to set the tone for your sentence. <laughs> Behavior aside, if the prosecutor feels that Jamarian has not satisfied the appropriate punishment that matches the crime, they could, of course, still seek an adult life sentence. So we don't know. I just think it's important to point out that that's a factor. Like I said, there's often times that we throw the book at these kids that they just have no chance at all, which is so frustrating. Yeah. So we really won't know and until it happens, right? But the hope is that he will thrive and be able to have a good record and hopefully get a appropriate sentence that meets whatever is fair for the Verkirky family and for him both. His defense attorney, Charles Bocalo, says, quote, all I know is clearly he was mentally ill and that was admitted by everyone. So whether they came up with a guilty but mentally ill verdict or not, mental illness still will likely be taken into account at sentencing. Jamarian's mother, Anita, said, quote, he's still a kid. I understand the severity of the case, but he's not an adult, and I know he has to be punished for his actions, but I do not believe he should get an adult sentence. His attorneys filed an appeal asserting that there was enough evidence to prove that his mental state was indeed a factor. But the appeal failed, and the appellate court rejected their insanity defense. Jamarian was housed in a Michigan juvenile facility about 70 miles north of Grand Rapids, Michigan, Muskegon River Youth Home. After the trial, Anita Lawhorn and the kid's stepfather, Bernard Harold, were finally charged with abusing the children. Finally. Too little, too late. Just wait. It's way too little. I, yeah. <laughs> All the children were removed from their home. Evidence was presented that the parents had beaten Jamarian with a belt as well as an extension cord. They were found guilty of fourth degree child abuse and each were sentenced to one year in prison plus five years of probation. Judge Paul Sullivan brought up the fault that they had in Jamarian's actions by saying, quote, 
I honestly don't know to what extent your actions caused or contributed at all. I suspect just because of Jamarian's remarks and what he did at the time that there was some casual connection in some way. Yeah, casual connection. Yeah, that's putting it lightly. Okay. I mean, specifically, he did it because he wanted to escape your monstrous abuse. So, And he was willing to be taken away to never see these people again. He was willing to die. He was willing to lose it all, if you will, right? And like, we'll take the death, because it's a kid thought, you know, but he was willing to just be like, I will never see my mother and my stepfather again. No problem. Today, take me. I will, absolutely no problem. That is a decision I can make right now. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a connection. It's the connection. It's the only connection. (laughs) During sentencing, the judge allowed the couple to serve their sentences one after the other so that there would always be one of them at home to care for the kids. Meaning... Yes, the kids were returned to their custody. What the fuck? I I can't understand why this would happen. Well, if they take them, they have to put them in foster care because there's obviously no family suitable. So in this situation, it keeps like four or five kids out of foster care in a system that's probably already just overwhelmed and struggling and you know, I know, but it's, and I'm trying no, to understand it's not okay. and have compassion. No, for this what... is just why they did it. It doesn't make yeah. it all right that they did it, but it's just you know. And then it's interesting to me. They gave them the judice sentence, where Teresa gets to go serve, so mm-hmm. Joe stays home with the girls, and now Joe is gone. And then you know, from there, but fuck, fourth degree. It's just crazy. Chi- like. I mean, I appreciate that they did this, to be honest, that they did get into some sort of trouble. But it just seems like a slap on the wrist to me, honestly. It's not enough. It's very depressing. It's not enough. Anita served her time first, and then Bernard went after her. But they ended up only serving about five months each. While Anita was on probation after her release, she violated her bail terms three times by testing positive for alcohol. So she was sent back to jail. There it is. I was like, wait a minute. They, yeah. They're going to have stipulations that they cannot meet. It's a, such a sad cycle. You just get stuck. I just I know that it's not enough for them to be sentenced for the kind of horrific mutilation and torture that they were doing to the kids five months does not seem appropriate she get, it just doesn't she had five years for each cigarette burn i mean like, seriously I don't get it. it is so evil to torture something so vulnerable you know yeah. that is your own child and i don't understand how there could be such a light sentence And like you said, even if they expect like, yeah, we're going to put conditions on you and you're going to end up back here because you're you're coming back struggling with active addiction and alcoholism, even if they know that that's a factor, it's still it just it breaks my heart. That doesn't seem fair and it doesn't seem like we're doing right by these kids. So even when Anita is out of jail, she doesn't make time to visit her son. Anita has been known to promise Jamarian that she will come visit and then tell him she'll be there on a certain day or time, but she never shows up. Yeah, this is goes right in line. The staff told her that it would be best for her son's well-being that she visit at least once a month. And they even offered to pick her up and provide transportation, but she still doesn't make an effort. That's really tragic. I know. They're trying to do everything they're to help her get her. there. We will pick you up. A government agency is like, we want you. You know what I mean? Like, we will come there. We won't charge you shit. Nothing. Right? We'll get you there. This is for his benefit. And by the way, it's your fault. So, so yeah. Maybe you should show up. It just, to me, also shows she doesn't feel bad for shit. She doesn't feel bad. She never has. And she is just, well, obviously, she's addicted substances, 
not thinking clearly. But yeah. to me, this is not like a maternal person at all. Just no, you know, connection in in the regard like mother to child for danger. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like keep your kids safe. And I just I I want to have, you know, knowing the active addiction and alcoholism is a factor. I want to have some compassion for just her mental state, but just what she has done and gotten away with, you know? That's why she keeps doing it. Ah, it's so frustrating because she's one of the biggest things that could make a difference in his well-being. If she's starting to turn over a new leaf and becomes a loving mother, he will be able to progress. But she's holding him back by making all these empty promises. At a progress hearing in juvenile court, the judge even tried to encourage Anita to visit more by saying, quote, Your visit seemed to make a significant difference to Jamarian. He loves you. He loves his siblings. He would like to see all of you as frequently as possible. Is there anything we can do to make this easier for you? And that is unbelievable. And again, I mean, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's like... Because there's no consequences for her, because she's always getting away with it, because everyone's just like, hey, what can we do to help you, even though you've done all these things wrong? How can we make it easier for you, Anita? Why would she turn over a new leaf? Why would she change? There's no incentive for her because there is no real punishment. She just keeps doing the same thing and getting away with it, essentially. She still has her kids. She's no, out of jail. her punishment is whatever it is inside that's making her so motivated to not be with it. Yeah. Like, let's be real. Yeah. There's, she's, there's I know deeper, she's suffering. She's broken. There's, there's more going on here. Yes. That she is not able. Like, I, I understand. But at the same time, like, oh, don't have kids. Yeah. If you're not able. <laughs> exactly. That there's, you know, things that we can do to get them into a loving home. And it's frustrating that she still got custody of these kids. She's struggling with her demon. She's suffering, but that's no excuse because these kids didn't do anything to deserve this. They were born into it. So when the judge is trying to figure out how to get her to come more frequently, Anita starts saying that she works third shift and she's often scheduled a lot of days a week. So it's hard for her to get there. She told the judge, quote, my main thing is finances. As much as I'd like to go see Jamarian, sometimes money doesn't provide for me to be able to get to see him. The judge said that for Jamarian's sake, all he could do is encourage her to put in more effort to see him. The facility staff members were conflicted on whether Anita's presence was actually a positive thing for Jamarian or if it would open old wounds. Although, of course, visits might bring up uncomfortable feelings, Jamarian was clearly affected by having his mother promise that she would visit and then just not show up. His counselor says, quote, As a result of her being so inconsistent, it does lead to mood swings on his end. Jamarian said that when he asks his mom why she doesn't visit, she just makes up excuses, and he thinks that she is lying to him. Yeah, she is. And she can tell the judge all she wants, that it's work, but it just, it's never been that. It's, it's always never been addiction. Been work. It's not, let's, no, 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 no. It's not work. She's working hard because it's not fun anymore. That's what she's working at. Yeah. When it's no longer fun, then it's a job, a full-time job to, to stay, stay okay. Yeah. That's what she's working at. The judge has made it clear that Anita should be encouraged to come, but that he will not issue a court order that she has to visit. Nuts. The other thing that comes up for me is this entire time they're arguing back and forth. She, she's making excuses. The judge is telling her to come. They're trying to say, what can we do to help you come? Like, what can we do to like provide transportation? Jamarian's sitting in the fucking courtroom listening to this to his mom basically argue the fact that she's not going to show up, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of how painful it would be. Not only is your mom have this long history of abuse with you, 
but she doesn't even want to show up to see you. And that's clear in the courtroom. And he's got to witness that. And that's so heartbreaking that he just sits through that. Yeah. While in the juvenile facility, Jamarian has been excelling in school, but he still has some outbursts. He struggles with severe depression and PTSD from his childhood, and counselors are trying to get him help to recover. He's extremely remorseful about what he did to Connor, and he has attempted suicide during his incarceration. When asked why he self-harms, Jamarian explained that he feels like he doesn't deserve to live after he took someone else's life. And again, it's just, he's not cold-hearted. I mean, this is just a fucked up, tragic thing that happened, but he really feels bad. Yeah, I, I believe He has that. a lot of regret. After acclimating a bit to being inside the facility, he began to thrive. At Jamarian's regular six-month hearing in November 2018, Judge Paul Denenfield said, quote, Am I missing something or is he doing as well as he seems to be doing? Yeah, no, he's doing that well. Right. It's like if yeah. he has the structure and he's given the support and he's got the mental health resources to treat his past... He's going to thrive. His caseworker responded by telling the judge that Jamarian has indeed made many positive changes and a lot of growth. After the judge praised Jamarian for his progress and taking responsibility for his crime, Jamarian responded by saying, quote, I thank God for all the support I got. I'm doing good. That's nice. Uh, yeah. Judge Denenfield said it was a long time ago when Jamarian accepted responsibility for this offense and continues to make no excuses for what happened here, which, of course, is important. I'm impressed with you every time I see you. I've been thrilled to watch how you have progressed. Connor Verkirke's family has said that they sincerely hope that Jamarian is able to get the help he needs. The Verkirke family has had, of course, a tough time since the loss of Connor. His brother Cameron, who witnessed his brother's murder, was plagued with nightmares and was extremely terrified that Jamarian will break out of jail and come kill him. Oh, it's so sad. I can't imagine this poor little thing. And he was the responsible one. Yeah, he was the one that was just coming up with a plan, yeah. trying to get help. I, I just... It, my heart aches for him. It was extremely traumatic to even come home since they had to cross the front porch where Connor lay dying after the attack. The family started a GoFundMe page to raise money to help them move. After collecting about 25k, they packed up and moved to a new home. Good idea. Yeah. yeah. I think that's I very this. healing for them, yeah. you know. Connor's parents, Danny and Jared Rikurgi, have been very vocal. They are satisfied with Jamarian's sentence, but they strongly feel that his parents should have been charged with murder for their part in damaging Jamarian enough to cause him to attack someone else. It's kind of what I was thinking this whole time. Exactly. It is some sort of liability. Even like a, you know, like manslaughter, or, you know what I mean? Like um, something. I would expect to see, what's that court called? When you go for damages. They couldn't get OJ in that, so they got him in the other court. Like civil, court. civil, there it is. I love you. Civil <laughs> court. I knew you'd help. Like, I, I'm surprised. Maybe they will, because it's only, you know, November 2018 was when it's still going on. So they might still be able to, at some point, prosecute. Yeah, I, I wonder. But I feel like... I think it's over. Generally... My feeling I get from the Verkirky family is they just want to move on. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's over. And they really, you know, they've got the same kind of stance that you or I have. They feel really compassionate for what Jamarian went through, you know, that really this was a result of his parents. This yeah. is his parents' fault. 
you know, and they were not held accountable enough. And five months for the kind of severe torture and damage that they did and the mental torment of their own kids and the death of this little boy. It's not enough. It wasn't enough. Nowhere near. And Jamarian's the one, of course, that has to be held accountable for what he did. And absolutely, they see it like, well, he's he's doing his time, but it's really more about the parents. We just did to that last episode we did um, with Dedrick Owens was that his uh, the uncle's friend whose gun it was, who he used to kill somebody. He he got I mean, it was only a couple of years, but he was prosecuted for it. Right. At least there's a charge yeah. there that's appropriate. It's just and- shocking to me that this specifically Anita, just nothing all along. And then they're just how can we help you still, Anita? What can right. we do for you? And over it's, and mean, over again. This is the reason that, you know, people do these things. It's just they just keep getting away with it. Nobody ever checks people, you know? Yeah. Like, and then this is theoretically how you keep somebody from doing this next time. It's not going to stop anybody because, oh, they got her for that. You know what I mean? But it's like the broken window theory. You start letting little things go and then the huge things just fall apart. And then you end up asking someone how you can help them. It's crazy to me. Absolutely. This, I mean, this case was like weighing so heavy. It just seems like a, a complete tragedy. It's just with, a loss everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And it just doesn't feel like there was enough done. What I think of is when we see that someone has a charge of like statutory rape or something and goes to jail for like three months and you know they're going to get out and we see in these cases where they go on to murder someone. And that's what it feels like is happening with his parents. We know that the five months isn't enough. The kids that are in their custody are going to continue to be yeah. abused and may not survive it. Yeah, You're putting lives still in jeopardy. Or they may end up doing something harmful to someone else, you know, because of what you're doing to them. So it just reminds me of like when we don't hold people accountable, it only makes it an opportunity for something to go wrong down the line. Yeah. And I feel like their kids are still at risk and they're still just damaging their children. So it's just a sad, sad case. Yeah. So it's about time we get out of here. Yes. And it's about time we move on to a new letter next week. The letter L. The letter letter. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah, it is the letter letter. We're doing letters for the letter L. That's fun. Because we are Murder Dictionary. So That's us. It's, you know, letters. It makes sense. It makes sense. We've got a few stories already prepped for you. So definitely check it out next week. In the meantime, if you want to get access to bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, and all of that, definitely check out our Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Murder Dictionary Podcast. And again, we want to say thank you to Shirley, Galilea, Angela, Lauren, and Michelle. Thank you. So thanks, you guys, for joining our Patreon. And again, like I said, we're back on Spotify. The disconnection is fixed. And we're on YouTube if that's an easy place for you to listen. So... I think that's pretty much it. If you aren't following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, definitely head over there and follow us. And if you want to read more about the cases, we've got the links to our resources every week in the show notes. Anything else from you, Court? Uh, No, I got nothing. Well, we're going to get out of here and we'll see you next week. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time. See ya. Bye. We all have songs that remind us of our first love and bands that make us think of a certain friend. Maybe you have a workout playlist or a favorite album to listen to on road trips. But do you ever wonder what was going on in the lives of the artist when they wrote the music that you connect to your own memories? Rockumentary Podcast fills in the blanks on what you may not know about the iconic artists making the music that's so meaningful to our own lives. Each episode is an in-depth biography spanning from musicians' childhood 
through all the challenges of their journey to success and how they handled finally achieving fame. On Rockumentary, you'll hear about Kurt Cobain becoming a janitor at the same high school that he dropped out of, or how Jimi Hendrix was kidnapped and held for ransom for two days. Our episodes include details about Notorious B.I.G. marrying Faith Evans after knowing her for only a week, and Phil Spector pulling a gun on the Ramones when they tried to end a long recording session. You may know the music, but on Rockumentary, you'll hear the stories behind the songs. Search for Rockumentary on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you like to listen to podcasts. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance. The housing industry is changing, a lot, quickly. That's why we made the Freddie Mac Multifamily Podcast. We're bringing together industry leaders to talk about market trends and the financing behind them. Subscribe and download wherever you get your podcasts.